PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. We're working to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Angeles, welcome to ASEAN in Focus. We're coming to you live from Manila in Thailand. Hello, happy birthday, Esther, and happy new year to you. Hi there, Alma. Thank you for remembering and happy new year as well. I'm Esther Adanga from EBC Thailand Bureau, bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. Malacanang so enjoined local government units to impose granular or localized lockdowns in areas with an uptick in COVID cases to prevent infections from again reaching an alarming level. The U.S., Japan, Singapore, Cambodia, and Chinese Taipei have basically agreed to resume regular international commercial flights with Vietnam from January 2022, according to the Ministry of Transport. Vice President Lenny Robredo is in quarantine following an exposure to a confirmed COVID-19 case. And the Department of Science and Technology, or DOST, leads the unveiling of the historical marker and the first ever 3D printed monuments of the Philippines national hero, Dr. Josepi Rizal, at the DOST Plaza in Taguig City on December 30, 2021. But first in our news, a powerful 7.3 magnitude quake struck off the coast of Indonesia's Maluku province in the early hours of Thursday, according to the U.S. Geological Survey in a statement. There were no immediate reports of tsunami warnings nor casualties or damage. The offshore quake took place around 3.25 a.m. local time, 18.25 GMT Wednesday, and hit a depth of 166 kilometers or 103 miles, about 120 kilometers northeast of the town of Los Palos. Indonesia experiences frequent quakes due to its position on the Pacific Ring of Fire, an arc of intense seismic activity where tectonic plates collide, which stretches from Japan through Southeast Asia and across the Pacific Basin. Malacanya on Wednesday and joined local government units or LGUs to impose granular or localized lockdowns in areas with an uptick in COVID-19 cases to prevent infections from again reaching an alarming level. Acting Presidential Spokesperson Cabinet Secretary Carlo Nograles said, President Rodrigo Duterte and the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases are concerned about the surge in infections, noting LGUs should step up in efforts to control the movement of people. Let's take a look. It is a So of course we are getting concerned. Of course we are getting worried. At dapat lang. Kaya... Ang panawagan, LUs, please enforce. Pag may tumataas ang bilang ng kaso, granular lockdown. Hindi po nawala sa equation ang granular lockdown. At responsibilidad po ng LGU mag-granular lockdown. Pag may nakita kayong uh, clustering of cases, huwag natin kalimutan yan. Uh, huwag natin hayaan na lumaki pa ito. Again, this is a shared responsibility. Hindi po dapat nakaatang lamang sa balikat ng pamahalaan ninyo or ng LGU. Nakaatang ito sa balikat nating lahat. It is a shared responsibility of all. Self-policing among yourselves, in your family, in your community, sa inyong barangay. Lahat po tayo, huwag nating sayangin ang lahat ng pinaghirapan po nating lahat. 
The entire country is currently under alert level 2, where most activities are allowed at a 50% indoor venue capacity for fully vaccinated individuals and at 70% outdoor venue capacity. As of Wednesday, the Philippines' COVID-19 cases jumped to 889, bringing the total number of cases to over 2.8 million. In a Viber message to reporters, Department of Health Under Secretary Maria Rosario Vergara said COVID-19 cases are expected to increase due to holiday-related mobility. Staying in the country, a DOH official on Wednesday said cases of COVID-19 are expected to increase due to holiday-related mobility. In a Viber message to reporters, Department of Health Undersecretary Maria Rosario Vergere said the uptick in the number of infections was also caused by reduced compliance to the minimum public health standards. She said we are continuously monitoring the situation, though we cannot still be certain that the increase in cases is due to the Omicron variant, she said. We are calling on the public and the LGUs to ensure safety protocols are implemented and every Filipino is vaccinated. On Wednesday, the DOH reported 889 new infections, more than 50% higher compared to 421 cases reported on Tuesday, bringing the country's total or overall tally to 2,839,790. The Okta Research Group said late Tuesday night that the positivity rate in the national capital region has increased by 5% for the first time since October. Positivity rate is the percentage of COVID tests performed which turned out positive in a certain area or region. The group reminded the public to observe the proper health protocols as the increase may not just be a holiday uptick. And we are joined live by Alfred Balmes from our Malaysia Bureau to give us an update on the current uh, flooding there in Malaysia. Hello, Alfred. Hi, Alma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Alfred. Go ahead. Malaysia exhibited the togetherness of Kilowarga, Malaysia in times of adversity. Despite of the national disaster, including major floods that hit several states and claim about almost 50 lives so far, with another pipe still reported missing. It showed how the rakyat, regardless of race and color, could be united in the face of common hardship. The 48 deaths in the floods, which was reported as of December 27, were the highest in the history of the flood disaster in Malaysia. Many said that high number of casualties, with most of them in Silangor, especially in, especially in the Klan Valley, was because the flood was unexpected. The effect was a total devastation. It was like they were hit by a tsunami. Thousands of people were evacuated to relief centers. The sense of family lo lost their homes as well as other belongings, including vehicles, which were either submerged in the floods or swept away by the current. Kalang Valley was in shock. The people were clearly not prepared to face a national nat natural disaster of this magnitude. In fact, the agencies that normally deal with such adversity were lost, not knowing how to react. The first 48 hours saw that the situation as chaotic. The agencies involved were lost with appeals for help and assistance in the Klang Valley field, the social media airwaves. According to the Prime Minister Datuk Siri Ismail Sabri Yaakob, the situation in Silangor is quite chaotic since the state is normally not affected by floods during the monsoon season. He stated during the press conference at the National Disaster Operation Control Center on December 18, members for the security forces, such as the police and the Malaysian Armed Forces, as well as the Parks and Rescue Department, all jumped into action to rescue victims trapped in the areas that are badly affected. At midnight on December 18, the Prime Minister instructed the Royal Malaysia Police and the MAFP to deploy more assets and to focus on rescuing lives, ensuring food supply for victims trapped in the, in the floods. According to the Environment and Water Ministry, Secretary General Dato Siri Air Dr. Saini Ujang, the heavy downpour that lasted over 24 hours since late December 17 was equal to the average rainfall for a month, which was one in 100 years weather event. The situation so filled million cubic meters of flood water diverted to Kuala Lumpur 
to the smart tunnel in an effort to lessen the impact of flooding in the downtown area of Kuala Lumpur. He said the smart diversion was activated up to mode force at 7.45 p.m. on December 18. It was the first time the process was let to run more than three hours since it was built in 2007. Silangor was not the only state hit by the flood, but also Pahang, Teringgano, Kilantan, Ningiri Sibilan, Milaka, Perak, and Kuala Lumpur, affecting 116,273 people from 31,949 families. Apart from that, landslides were also reported in several areas among them. In Karak, resulting sc scores of road users become trapped. They were saved by the search and rescue team. The flood also turned in a resort area in Jandam Balik into a disaster area after being hit by the water surge. Two occupants of the surge were found down, drawn, and another was still missing. Following this shocking disaster, non-governmental organizations and people from all walks of life, irrespective of race and religion from all over the country, came forward to offer help by providing basic necessities and joining in the cleanup efforts. In an effort to lessen the burden of the flood victims, the government announced an initial allocation of 100 million to repair homes and damaged infrastructure, as well as 1,000 Malaysian ringgit and Bantuan Wang Insan for every household affected by the floods. The government also announced interest-free financial aid up to 5,000 Malaysian ringgit through Bank Simpangan National and allocated 30 million Malaysian ringgit for flood recovery loan through Tico National. As for cooperative, cooperative affected by the floods, they could seek an aid up to 30,000 Malaysian ringgit through Bantuan Kisimakan Cooperacy of the Malaysian Cooperative Commission. Back to you, Alma. All right. Thank you very much. And as we uh, face more or a stronger storms due to climate change, we really hope that uh, we can uh, solve all these uh, floodings over there in Malaysia. Thank you very much, Alfred, for that update. Stay safe. Likewise, live reporting from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. This is Alfred Balmes. We live in interesting times. Meanwhile, an outpour of relief aid from different foreign donors continues for the victims of Typhoon Odette, with more countries sending more goods and pledging cash, including the United States, South Korea, China, United Arab Emirates, and Qatar. On Wednesday, Foreign Affairs Secretary Chodoro Loxin Jr. personally thanked the U.S. government for its additional 950 million pesos humanitarian assistance to the country, which would provide the worst hit communities in the Visayas and Mindanao with food, water and temporary shelter needs. We welcome the urgent action taken by the U.S. government in mobilizing funds and its people to support us in our time of great need. I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincerest gratitude to the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. aid. You are indeed our allies, partners and friends, he said in a joint presser at the DFA office in Pasay. Loxin stressed that the U.S. is now the single largest country contributor to the government's effort to help communities severely impacted by the typhoon begin the process of rebuilding their homes and lives. U.S. Embassy Chargery, the affair at interim Heather Variava said the U.S. will continue to partner with the Philippines to strengthen its natural disaster response and support Filipinos in recovery efforts. Meanwhile, the UN Security Council on Wednesday condemned last week's massacre in Myanmar of more than 30 people, including two Save the Children staff that was blamed on junta troops. The killings took place on Christmas Eve in eastern Kaya State, where pro-democracy rebels have been fighting the military, which took over the government from the democratically elected administration in February. In a statement released Wednesday evening, Security Council members stressed the need to ensure accountability for this act. They also called, quote, for the immediate secession of all violence and emphasized the importance of respect for human rights and of ensuring safety of civilians, unquote. The statement said, quote, at least 35 people, including four children and two staff of Save the Children charity, 
were killed in the attack. The Security Council also stressed the need for safe and unimpeded humanitarian access to all people in need and for the full protection, safety and security of humanitarian and medical personnel. Anti-Junta fighters say they have found more than 30 burnt bodies, including women and children, on a highway in Kaya State following the attack. Two Save the Children employees have been missing and the rights group confirmed on Tuesday that they were among the dead. The MAC polls conducted in Metro Manila and several provinces in preparation for the 2022 national and local elections were successful, the Commission on Elections or COMELEC said on Wednesday. COMELEC spokesperson James Jimenez said many people have participated in the activity which simulated the election process from voting to canvassing. He said the mock polls held in huge areas have a very high turnout. He, however, noticed some concerns, particularly in the implementation of health protocols against the COVID-19 pandemic. Jimenez said the results of mock elections will be reviewed to determine areas that need to be improved going into actual election day on May 9, 2022. Attorney Ronald Santiago, election officer of 1st District in Pasay City, said maintaining physical distancing was one of the challenges they encountered. Registered voters from cities of Pasay, Taguig, and the municipality of Pateros and provinces of Isabela, Albay, Negros Oriental, Leyte, Maguindanao, and Davao del Sur have participated in the mock polls. And Indonesia on Wednesday said it will let dozens of Rohingya refugees come ashore after protests from locals and the international community over its plan to push them into Malaysian waters. At least 100, mostly women and children, aboard a stricken wooden vessel of Aceh province were denied refuge in Indonesia, where authorities on Tuesday said they plan to push them back into the neighboring Southeast Asian country after fixing their boat. After a day-long meeting on Wednesday between officials in the coastal town of Birun, Jakarta, backtracked, and said the refugees' boat, they backtrack and said the refugees' boat will be now towed to shore on humanitarian grounds. Indonesian authorities first spotted the wooden boat two days ago, stranded about 70 nautical miles off the Indonesian coast, according to a local Navy commander. Local fishermen had alerted them on December 25, one of them said. On Tuesday, Amnesty International and the UNHCR called on the government to let the stranded group of Rohingya refugees land. The earlier plan by authorities in Aceh to send the refugees into Malaysia also angered locals in Beirut, where a group of fishermen on Wednesday organized a protest demanding authorities to instead allow the Rohingya to disembark. In other news, Dutch prosecutors on Wednesday called for life in prison for four suspects on trial in absentia accused of downing Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 over Ukraine with a surface-to-air missile killing 298 people. The ill-fated flight heading for Kuala Lumpur took off from Amsterdam Schiphol Airport in July 2014 and prosecutors this week launched closing arguments in the closely watched trial. Let's take a look. Wij vorderen de verdachte Gerkin, Dubinsky, Pulatov en Gartjenko ieder voor het in vereniging doen voor ongelukken van een vliegtuig met de dood tot gevolg en de moord in vereniging op 298 inzittenden te veroordelen tot een levenslange gevangenisstraf. A verdict is not expected until late 2022 at the earliest. The four suspects on trial are Russian nationals, Igor Gurkin, Sergei Dubinsky, and Oleg Pulatov, and Ukrainian citizen Yonid Karchenko, accused of launching the book missile that hit the plane over war-torn eastern Ukraine. All four have refused to appear in court in the, in the Netherlands and are being tried in absentia. 
Prosecutors have agreed have argued this week that four suspects played pivotal roles in securing the book system, which was most likely intended to strike a Ukrainian warplane. International investigators say the missile was originally brought from a Russian military base, ostensibly to be used in the fight against Ukrainian forces. Prosecutors said the missile's deployment was planned and organized and that it did not matter whether the suspects made a mistake in targeting a passenger plane. The hearings come as fresh tensions soar over Ukraine, with the West accusing Moscow of planning an invasion. Kiev has been battling a pro-Moscow insurgency in two breakaway regions bordering Russia since 2014, when the Kremlin annexed Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. Russia has recently massed troops near Ukraine's border, and the West has four weeks accused, accused it of planning an invasion, warning Moscow of massive sanctions should it launch an attack. Moscow denies the claims with President Vladimir Putin seeking talks with the U.S. counterpart Joe Biden and security guarantees to stand down his troops. Back here in the country, police and anti-narcotics agents have arrested two suspects and seized $534 million worth of shabu in a by bus operation in Mandaluyong City, according to the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, or PIDEA. In a statement, PIDEA spokesperson Derek Carrion said that suspects Mike Abak, 32, and Edison de Guzman, 37, both residents of Guadalupe Nuevo, Makati City, were arrested at a condominium unit at around 6 p.m. on Monday. During the operation, the authorities seized 77.5 kilograms of shabu, some of which were placed inside red Chinese tea bags, estimated to be worth 534.75 million pesos, various drug paraphernalia, and a mobile phone. And Esther and I will be back right after this short break. Welcome back to the program. The U.S., Japan, Singapore, Cambodia, and Chinese Taipei have basically agreed to resume regular international commercial flights with Vietnam from January 2022, according to the Ministry of Transport. The Civil Aviation Authority of Vietnam has licensed Vietnam Airlines to launch the first regular commercial flight to Japan on January 5, 2022, which will be followed by Vietjet Air and Japan's all Nihon Airways on January 6, 2022. The Ministry of Transport has sought the Prime Minister's approval 
for increasing regular commercial flights to seven per week to Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Chinese Taipei. On December 26, Permanent Deputy Prime Minister Pam Bin Min assigned the Ministry of Transport to work with other ministries, agencies, and localities to meticulously consider and decide on the resumption of international commercial air routes. The guidance was made following the request by the national flag carrier of Vietnam Airlines to resume regular scheduled commercial flights to Europe and Oceania. On December 10, the government has approved the resumption of commercial flights between Vietnam and nine destinations with high vaccination rates and good pandemic control measures in place, starting from January 1, 2022. Specifically, regular flights are scheduled to resume to Bangkok, Thailand, Beijing and, and Guangzhou, China, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, San Francisco or Los Angeles in the United States, Seoul of the Republic of South Korea, the Singapore, Taiwan, China and Tokyo, Japan and Vientiane, Lao. Meanwhile, the Philippines on Wednesday night hit over 210 million in secured vaccine doses since the pandemic started as it received yet another batch of Moderna jabs procured by the private sector. NTF against COVID-19 consultant Lieutenant Colonel Francel Margareth Taborlupa reiterated the government's appeal on all unvaccinated to get jabbed as soon as possible, especially now with the entry of the Omicron variant in the country. Take a look. It's very alarming that in just a couple of days, tumaas ng tumaas ang positivity rate natin. So, ibig sabihin po, medyo meron pong effect yung paglabas natin ng totally. So, not, um, we encourage everyone to still be very protected. Together with other officials from the government, they welcome the arrival of 1,230,800 doses of Moderna jabs, which she said would greatly contribute to the country's target of vaccinating 54 million people. The latest shipment will be used for first and second doses, as well as for booster shots. Data from the DOH show that over 60 million doses of vaccines were delivered to the Philippines in December alone, with more donations and procured doses expected to arrive before 2021 ends. The official noted that the government is also aiming to vaccinate at least 77 million people before the 2022 election and kick off the inoculation drive for 5 to 11 years old by mid-January. With enough jabs in the country's stockpile, she said this is achievable. Now let's go over to Indonesia, where the country received 1,236,000 Sinovac doses via the COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access or COVAX facility on Wednesday. The vaccines, which were the 182nd batch to arrive in the country, took the total number of vaccine doses Indonesia has received so far to 458,069,415. Hence, the total number of vaccines which have arrived in Indonesia since the first batch, both in the form of raw material as well as finished vaccines, has reached 458,069,415 doses. Director General of Information and Public Communication at the Communications Informat Informatics Ministry, Usman Kan Song, said on Wednesday. He also said the government is also expecting the community to actively participate in the program to establish urge immunity as soon as possible. The Indonesian government has started booster vaccinations for medical workers so far, according to the COVID-19 Task Force website. As of December 29, 2021, 1,286,928 health workers have received the boosters. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Health on December 29 reported four new COVID cases, one of which was imported and confirmed to be the Omicron 
variant. In Cambodia, the ministry also reported nine recoveries and one new death, nothing that the deceased had not been vaccinated against COVID-19. As of December 29, Cambodia had recorded a total of 120,473 COVID cases with 116,894 recoveries and 3,011 fatalities. Now in Thailand, the country's Ministry of Public Health says Omicron infections in Thailand are rising with 740 cases confirmed in 33 provinces, 489 of which were imported, while the balance were local infections linked to those. Dr. Supakit Sirilak, Director General of the Department of Medical Sciences, said at least 108 countries have detected cases of the highly transmissible strain, while all states of the, U of the U.S. have recorded cases, pointing to the need for continuous monitoring of the variant's development. He said Bangkok has recorded the highest number of Omicron infections due to most tests being conducted in the capital after travelers arrived at Suwanabum Airport. About 200 new cases of Omicron were confirmed on Monday and Tuesday when roughly 5,000 new COVID-19 infections were recorded, which means Omicron cases accounted for 6% of all COVID-19 cases detected in the same period. In related news, Bangkok Governor Aswin Kwan Wong signed an order dated Dece December 28 to extend until January 15 a November 29 directive to keep night entertainment venues, including pubs, bars, massage parlors, and karaoke shops closed. And back here in the country, Vice President Lenny Robredo is in quarantine following an exposure to a confirmed COVID case. The Vice President made the announcement in a Facebook Live video published on Wednesday. She also said she underwent quarantine after receiving a call on Tuesday night that one of her close-in security staff members had tested positive for COVID-19. Robredo said her quarantine would last beyond January since, quote, our protocol in the office is to go on quarantine for seven days. This is the second time Robredo had to self-quarantine following exposure to a positive COVID case. Robredo is fully vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine and she received her booster shot of Moderna. And the news continues here in ASEAN in Focus. Alma and I will be back after this. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang paghirap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin ito pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa New Era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. Vietnam reported economic growth for this year of just 2.58% on Wednesday. 
beating a 30-year low set last year as the pandemic continues to take a toll. The communist state has long been a success story among Asian economies, posting growth of 7% in 2019. But shutdowns caused by coronavirus have battered the export-reliant economy, sending GDP growth plunging to 2.91% last year, the lowest reported in three decades. The General Statistics Office in Hanoi said fourth quarter growth was at 5.22%, but the annual figure was dragged down by a contraction of 6.02% in the third quarter. For at least three months, almost the entire country was in complete lockdown with a huge impact on production, supply chains, and businesses. GSO head Nguyen T. Wong gave an upbeat gloss, saying that achieving even the modest growth under such difficult circumstances was a huge success in remarks reported by state media. Vietnam is now trying to reopen by shifting away from its strict zero-COVID policy. Around 88% of adults in Vietnam have now been fully vaccinated, according to the country's health ministry. Meanwhile, Asian stocks were mostly flat on Thursday in cautious trade following a mixed close on Wall Street and ahead of year-end holidays. Fears of the Omicron coronavirus variant also weighed on markets, with the United States hitting its highest ever average of new COVID cases and the World Health Organization warning that a tsunami of infections would push health systems to the brink of collapse. But investors have also clung to the data showing a reduced risk of hospitalization, as well as the reality that trading volumes are extremely low in the period between Christmas and New Year. Despite global surges in COVID-19 COVID cases, the markets are reflecting the new reality that COVID is here to stay, albeit more on our terms than this. Kevin Phillip, Managing Director at Bel Air Investment Advisors, said in an email. Next year, he said we are facing less of a COVID influence world and return towards normalcy. Tokyo was marginally down in early trade, while Hong Kong was slightly up. Shanghai was up by about 1%. The Banco Central ng Pilipinas, or BSP, projected that the country's inflation in December would settle between 3.5% and 4.3%, driven by higher electricity rates and uptick in food prices. Higher electricity rates, along with the uptick in food prices due to weather disturbances, are the primary sources of inflationary pressures during the month, according to the BSP in a statement. And it added these could be, this could be offset in part by rollbacks in domestic petroleum prices and the appreciation of peso, according to the BSP. Nonetheless, the BSP also assured the public that it will continue to monitor emerging price developments to help achieve its primary mandate of price stability that is conducive to balanced and sustainable economic growth of the economy. The country's average inflation rate in November, or the rate that prices of goods increase, slowed to 4.2% compared to 4.6% posted in October due to cheaper food items. However, the rate was higher compared to the 3.3% posted in November last year. In the Philippines, the government is expected to collect an additional 120 billion pesos worth of revenue with the resumption of open pit mining operations nationwide. This is according to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENR. In a televised interview on Wednesday, Environment Under Secretary Jonas R. Jonas said this is expected amount of funds to be collected by the government from four mining firms that will benefit and that will benefit from the Department Administrative Order or DAO number 2021-40. The issuance, which was signed last week, lifted the four-year-old ban on the open pit method for mining. The DNR official disclosed the ban on open pit mining was reviewed as the government looks for additional revenue to fund its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Environmental groups oppose the new policy, which they allege will lead to more environmental degradation. 
Yonas assured the public, however, that the DNR and other concerned agencies will closely monitor mining firms with open pit mines to make sure they comply with all environmental laws. The resumption of open pit mine, Yonas said, will allow the country to utilize its steel and tap mineral resources. Bringing back the electricity in Bohol has been a challenge for the DOE or Department of Energy Task Force and on Energy Resiliency or TFER. But power in the province is expected to be back or is already back late Wednesday night or by Thursday morning. Now, in a press briefing Wednesday, DOE Director Mario Marasigan said that TFER is committed to partially restoring power in Bohol before the year ends. He added that there is now a power barge in Bohol that is ready to partially supply the needs of Bohol Light as well as the other two electric cooperatives in the province. National Grid Cooperation or Corporation of the Philippines or NGCP Engineering Project Management Department Head Randy Galang confirmed that zero transmission lines in Bohol were restored since the onslaught of Typhoon Odette last December 16. Meanwhile, the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, through its partner non-government organizations, or NGOs, distributed relief assistance on Wednesday to 1,000 families from Barangay Sabang and Talisay. The USA relief distribution was facilitated by the Action Against Hunger and International Organization for Migration, or IOM. Each of the affected families in two barangays received 35 kilos of rice and non-food items consisting of hygiene kits, toothpaste, shampoos, and bath towels, among others. Of the total number of family beneficiaries, 600 were from Barangay Sabang, while 400 were residents of Barangay Talisay. The organization, in partnership with USAID, will also work for rehabilitation and recovery of Shergao Island, specifically on the first three weeks of January 2022. The other USAID partner organization, the IOM, said it will focus on management of evacuation centers or shelters for affected families as well as provision of critical relief of critical relief supplies, including heavy-duty plastic shading. This city was among the severely devastated areas in Surigao del Norte when Typhoon Odette made landfall in Shargao Island on December 16. And staying in the country, President Duterte has signed the 5.024 trillion national budget for 2022 into law. The president's signing came 15 days after Congress ratified the same. The budget includes a 50 billion peso funding for COVID-19 vaccines and 50 billion pesos for the special risk allowances of medical frontliners. It also includes 22.9 billion pesos for the improvement of health facilities and funding for the recovery of areas severely hit by Typhoon Odette. The palace earlier said it was eyeing the creation of a separate 5 billion peso fund for the rehabilitation of Odette hit areas for the year 2021, President Duterte signed a 4.506 trillion peso budget that also includes funding for COVID-19 programs. As it in focus, we'll go for a short break. Esther and I will be back. Po si Joanne Lorenzana na bumabati po ng Happy New Year. Abangan po ninyo ako sa January 1 sa Letters and Music dito lamang po sa NET 25. Ah! Ang 
inyong pinakabagong gag show dito sa Net25. Walang iba kundi ang Season TV! Welcome back. Now, Chanatip Song Krasin scored it twice as Thailand closed in on a 6 AFF Suzuki Cup title with a 4-0 thumping of Indonesia in the first leg of the final on Wednesday. The Thai captain opened the scoring at the National Stadium in Singapore in the second minute and added another just after the interval. Goals by Supachok Sarachat and Bordin Pala can put the five-time champions in firm control ahead of the second leg on Saturday. Indonesia's disappointment in the competition looks set to, to continue and they have been beaten in their previous five appearances in the finals, including losses to the ties in year 2000, 2002 and 2016. Thailand made seven changes to their starting lineup after their semi-final victory over defending champions Vietnam, but they started strongly and went in front after less than 90 seconds. Philip Roller showed great persistence to get past two defenders on the right of the box before squaring for Chanatip to fire home. The ties almost extended their lead in 14th minute when the boarding's effort was cleared off the line and came back to Yusef Elias Dola who headed over the crossback. The crossbar. Despite Thailand's dominance, Indonesia had a chance to get back on level terms just before the interval when Alfendra Dewanga blazed over with only goalkeeper Sirawak Ted Swengon to beat. The ties tightened their grip with the second goal seven minutes after the interval. Supachok was surrounded by three defenders in Indonesian box, but he laid the ball off the Chana he laid the ball off to Chanatib to place a low shot past Nadeo Argawitana for his fourth goal of the tournament. Irfan Jayambi's a golden opportunity to narrow the deficit when his effort was stopped by the feet of Siwarak. And for the Indonesians would rue that a miss as Supachok rifled home a shot from outside the box to make it 3-0 in the 67th minute before Borden completed the route with his side for seven minutes from time. Meanwhile, the Department of Science and Technology, or DOST, is le has led the unveiling of the historical marker and the first ever 3D printed monument of the Philippines national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal, at the DOST Plaza in Taguig City today. Take a look. Congresswoman Maria Laarte Cayetano, DOST Undersec. We popularized these annotations of Antonio de Morga's Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas in which Rizal corrected misconceptions of, for, of foreigners about our ancestors. Since we are now in the midst of a pandemic, it is appropriate that we discuss Rizal as a scientist and his contributions to the different disciplines he engaged himself. He knew that a free and prosperous nation requires its citizens to be healthy. Because of this, he healed this countryman of various illnesses, even if his specialization was in the field of ophthalmology. He did this while exiled in the Pitan, where many of his patients were poor and underprivileged. Up to now, Filipinos pay tribute to his being a physician. His surgical instruments are currently in display in our museum in the Pitan. We should also relieve the natural curiosity and observant eye of Rizal. He used this not only on social issues, but also on the natural world. This helped him in his research on how to grow crops in his Dapitan estate. He also sent preserved animal samples to his European friends, which led to the identification of this animal species. In recognition of his contributions, some of the species he identified were named after him. 
The lizard doc documented was called Draco Rizali. The frog he identified was called Racophorus Rizali. And the beetle was named Apogonia Rizali. For these reasons, the theme of this year's commemoration of his martyrdom is Rizal, para sa agham, katotohanan, at buhay. At a time when the works of scientists are being questioned and the truth itself is twisted for self-gain, Rizal reminds us that we can only have a comfortable life if we respect science and defend the truth from those who want to destroy it. The painting of the 3D monument is held in conjunction with the country's commemoration of the 125th anniversary of the martyrdom of Dr. Jose Rizal. The statue stands at 12.5 feet and depicts the national hero as a medical scientist, an engineer, surveyor, an agriculturist, and a naturalist, environmentalist. Said They said the product is a collaboration between the DOST and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. That structure is further reinforced using steel structure inside the monument that is designed to withstand winds of 330 kilometers per hour and a 7.0 magnitude earthquake. This work of art and science is designed by Professor Jose Manuel Sicat with Rizal, the Filipino scientist, as the embodiment of innovation and positive change, thus bringing science closer to the people. Thank you very much, Esther, for keeping me company today. And you have a very happy birthday. What do you plan to Thank do? Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm planning to stay at home okay. and to have Safer. video call with the family. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You have a great time and uh, say hello to your family. And happy yes. birthday to uh, Sister uh, Vilma um, Regalado. Happy, happy birthday po. I'm sorry I forgot to greet you yesterday. Yes, belated happy birthday there's po, always Sister a time. Vilma yes. Regalado. Very, ha very happy belated birthday. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, uh, thank Esther, you, for keeping me company as always. You know, it's always my pleasure. And of course, uh, special greetings to all our viewers in Southeast Asia and to Brother Vilen Regalado. And that is the latest news in the Southeast Asian nations. Stay updated about the ASEAN region. I'm Esther Adanga from EBC Thailand Bureau, and we live in interesting times. And we'll see you back tomorrow, same time, same place. You're on ASEAN in Focus. I'm Alma Angeles. We live in interesting times.